Welcome to Futures Talks. This interview is brought to you by Imagine Institute of Future Studies at Ikra University and Comstack, Organization of Islamic Cooperation and Standing Committee on Scientific and Technological Development of OIC. We are delighted to present a leading social scientist belonging to an OIC member state, Malaysia. Honorable Datu Shri, Dr. Zaleha bin Kamaruddin was appointed the first female rector of the International Islamic University, Malaysia in 2011, making her the first woman to head an Islamic uh, university in the Muslim world. She has been appointed as a member of the Religious Council of Faha in 2020. She was involved in drafting 14 model laws at the Prime Minister's department. She's also the first woman to be appointed as a Sharia Appellate Court Judge in Malaysia's Sharia Judicial History in 2018. She was appointed as a member of the Selangor Council of Religious Affairs for 10 years from 2004 to 2014 at the state level. She's also a member of the Fatwa Committee for the state of Selangor. She is the Deputy Chair for the Board of Governors of University College, Yayasan Pahang, and also chairs the Yayasan Tabung Suanka Chancellor of UCYP. She was a member of the Technical Committee on Sharia and Civil Laws between 2005 and 2018 at the federal level. She was a member of the Department of Islamic Religious Affairs. She has represented the OIC Women Consultative Council in a high-level panel discussion at the 63rd Commission on the Status of Women in New York in March 2019. Professor Zaleha has been actively involved in UN Habitat training workshops all over the world as a consultant trainer who believes in research-based contributions to women's issues. Professor Zaleha has served as the chief editor of IIUM Law Journal and the theme of IKIM. She is also a member of international advisory board of several internationally refereed journals of Pakistan, Bosnia, Brunei, Darussalam, and Turkey. Thank you so much, Professor Datushri, Dr. Zalia Kamruddin, for joining us today from Malaysia in Futures Talk. Thank you, Prof. Shah, for having me this evening. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Zalia, the first thing we would like to know is about your uh, uh, personal journey. What was your life like growing up in Malaysia? Uh, where did you go to school? Uh, what, uh, where did you go for your higher education? Your, your, your personal journey, if you could tell us about that, we will really appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Prof. Sham. This is a very personal question. Um, I was born and bred in Malaysia, all over Malaysia. Um, life uh, was, I would say, encouraging towards education. Uh, where I spend most of my time in the library of uh, my secondary school, because that's the only place for me to wait while waiting for transportation to take me home. So from there, uh, you know, almost um, uh, like books are the gates for life beyond Malaysia, where I try to read as much as I can. Um, but uh, upon looking back what has happened uh, when I was doing uh, my law degree at the University of Malaya, uh, I found um, that I was standing on the shoulders of giants, um, specifically uh, Professor Ahmad Ibrahim, he was then the Dean of the Faculty of Laws. Uh, from there, um, he took me when he set up um, the Kuliah of Laws at the International Islamic University in Malaysia. 
and um, and 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 the journey into into this academic world starts from there. Although he wanted me to do my chain ring, I did for ten months. Go to the bar, um, and then uh, I went to do my uh, advanced diploma in Sharia law and practice. Uh, and uh, and then masters was directly under him, uh, working on comparative family laws, and uh, and then he requested me to go overseas uh, to further my studies for my doctorate. So basically, like uh, it was not my my plan on this journey, but it was like uh, I would say it was fated. Stated that I go into this line. Um, I I would have been uh, uh, perhaps a judge by now if I were to stay in the judiciary and um, were were there following the footsteps of my seniors, but it did not happen there. So I believe that uh, Allah has put me in this journey. Uh, uh, again, I say it's a really painted, and um, I try to contribute the best that I can uh, with the training that I had, with the teachers that were there to guide me. And I'm happy, I'm happy, and I, uh, I, I would say that I am very passionate about uh, what I did um, yeah, so far. Uh, uh, Dr. Az Azalia, you uh, have uh, grown up um, in Malaysia, and uh, how did you see the gender relation evolving um, throughout your lifetime, especially from the perspective of a woman living in Malaysia? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, in Malaysia, you know, in my younger days, I did not realize uh, they were discrimination because I was brought up among brothers. And, and then I went to all girls school. Again, I did not face that discrimination yet. Yet, I would say. Uh, and then I went to do my uh, first degree. Also, I did not face any, I would say, big challenges in terms of gender relations. It was later, when it comes to starting my career, uh, I started to hear this and that, and then personally uh, facing the problem itself. I would say challenges. Then I realized that um, challenges are everywhere. It's just how we react to these challenges is uh, important. Uh, and then um, um, in the... 80s, I would say in the 80s, uh, when I was younger, um, I started uh, working on gender relations in terms of, uh, although I was doing law then, but looking into human rights or women's rights as human rights, then I started to, to start reading deeper, thinking deeper about the issues. And then it was, uh, I would say, when when I was was and still is uh, an activist. You know, instead of just looking at this theoretically uh, on the ground, there were many issues. Uh, and then we we started to network with um, our sisters uh, beyond the shores of Malaysia. They were facing a lot of problems as well, a lot of challenges. Um, but every country has their own has their own challenges. And um, uh, I went to do my PhD. I saw it with my own eyes when I when I go beyond the shores of Malaysia and uh, started visiting all these countries and saw uh, gender relations. And it's discrimination firsthand. Uh, Alhamdulillah, a journey of I would say more than 35 years uh, has put me um, uh, in a situation 
where um, um, I could be, I, I wouldn't call myself a third. I would say a specialist in the area of gender relations, especially in relation to law because of the connections and because of the uh, network that I had with um, first with OIC, I, um, I, I, I am with the Women Consultative Council of OIC and um, uh, we went to, send, to visit several places. We see the, uh, uh, we, we saw discriminations firsthand and um, I, my assessment of Malaysia would be uh, compared to other countries, Malaysia is considered uh, okay, okay, but uh, there are so many other things that need to be done when it comes to women's rights. Still, there's rules for improvement, yeah. Maybe I could see the improvement in my lifetime, maybe not. Only Allah will know exactly what will happen in the future. Yeah. So, uh, Professor, uh, you have contributed a great deal and uh, you have participated in different councils. Uh, you, have, uh, you have been part of uh, the, uh, uh, the Fatwa Committee, Sharia Committee. You have uh, uh, helped in making model laws for, for uh, the Prime Minister's office. So, yeah. I mean, you have taken up a lot of leadership role. As a female in a leadership role in a developing Muslim country, what kind of challenges you had as a leader? Oh, well, that's a very um, uh, question is often uh, posed to me. Uh, I, I would say that I have to be a good role model for the rest of younger women to come in into this area. Uh, I have to show that um, uh, uh, I am good, not just good, but uh, better than good uh, in terms of uh, in terms of contributing uh, in the area that has uh, that I have been appointed. Uh, if I need to work let's say at the level of 10, I will give, say, 20. Uh, I will put in more hours, do more homework, do more research uh, uh, to contribute to that particular area. For example, I'm just giving an example, like uh, there will be uh, a lot of readings, a lot of readings. Uh, in fact, I would uh, normally um, Supply the uh, uh, committee with uh, extra information. So it's always like uh, uh, looking into Google Scholar, looking into the latest research on this, um, this and that. Uh, and I have, Alhamdulillah, a group of network to supply me with all the information. I just need to, you know, ring them up and say yes. Can I have this information? Can I have that information? So I would say that um, the, it's not a secret. I would say it's an open secret that we need a lot of support. We have to create a support group uh, to have all this extra information. Um, uh, in all the uh, technical committees that I'm in, um, I, I I would say that uh, I give my not just full commitment plus plus commitment um, uh, not just to be there to warm the seat just to be quiet but uh, to supply them with the latest information and not just information but things that we could do and. Um, Alhamdulillah, Allah has guided me. I, I believe in all the, uh, not just capabilities, but also the uh, ilham. I would say ilham uh, to come up with something beyond, uh, beyond norms. Yeah, beyond norms. Um, uh, 
yeah, working beyond norms is very important. Uh, like today, they say uh, to think out of the box. Um, during that time, it's not like uh, there is no certain um, term like they use to be out of the box. We, we just, I, I just thought that um, uh, being, being not just being an intellectual, but to not just participate, but uh, to make whatever it is one notch up. One notch up from the norm. Or perhaps I could go two or three notch up. So that's my answer on this, uh, Prof. Uh, Professor, uh, another question that I have is that how did your interest grow in law, Islamic Sharia, and family support system? Um, again, I, I would have to go back to my younger, younger days. Um, when I was doing law, uh, an LLB, uh, with honours at Ministry of Malaya, again, I, I mentioned about standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, my dean has created a curriculum uh, that offered at the same time uh, several uh, subjects under the Sharia. Uh, I realized as a Muslim, I uh, should not just study civil laws, but also study Islamic law at the same time. And alhamdulillah, I realized that my passion on doing, uh, I would say, uh, these are considered uh, subjects, uh, optional subjects to be taken. And I feel the tendency of taking those subjects uh, besides the basic subjects that I need to do, and I feel that because of my interest, I, I uh, you know, reading these subjects uh, beyond uh, what has been given by the lecturers um, has propelled me further. Uh, and um, and I have gone beyond uh, reading, reading um, to the point of like uh, non-stopping. It's like uh, non-stop working, writing, reading. Uh, and then uh, I, I went to see my teachers uh, and, and told them I have great interest in this area. And then from there, when uh, Professor Ahmad Ibrahim Gadim uh, left uh, University Malaya to set up uh, an, uh, a law school, yeah, um, he has basically integrated civil laws and Islamic law. So um, he invited me to join the International Islamic University. Uh, and I became the first batch of students. We started off 10 students, so at the end of the day, it became only two. Um, working on, at that time, Masters in Comparative Laws. Uh, I would say that it is, quote unquote, uh, would say difficult for me because of my interest. And I, uh, from there, from there, I think I found my calling um, and started uh, doing it seriously uh, at a level where um, I uh, supplied information to my professors. And being uh, at that time appointed, uh, being young, I think I was younger, uh, age of 24, 25, you know, working on collecting all this information, supplying all this information. As a research assistant, when I found the last two connection myself, I became a research assistant to the uh, Chief Justice then, to so, so And uh, uh, Alhamdulillah, I gained uh, a lot of exposure working with him uh, for a year before he passed away. Uh, but uh, he managed to write a forward for my first book. Uh, strict liability in criminal law, but I was looking from the Islamic perspective. 
So by getting um, uh, experts from both areas, um, knowing that uh, and understanding that Malaysia has a uh, dual legal system has uh, given me um, much benefit, much benefit knowing both systems and being able to compare both systems and being able to identify a lacuna uh, in each system. So it's like crisscrossing here and there and uh, and given the opportunity by these great people to work with them. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Zalia, you have uh, participated in different positions and you are a religious scholar. And uh, we, uh, I mean, I would like to know how important do you think it is for females to uh, be represented in these bodies like uh, the appellate court and um, uh, in the religious uh, uh, bodies set up by the government, how important is the representation of women? And uh, do you see that as an emerging trend that women are participating as a religious, as a religious scholar in OIC countries, including Malaysia? Yes, uh, I believe um, when Allah created men and women, there must be a reason. I mean, if it's all men, uh, if it's an all men committee, they wouldn't, they, they would not have, I, I would feel that I would not have the opportunity to voice the, the gender concern on certain things. For example, let me give you an example. For example, uh, when I was appointed uh, in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, 2017, 2018, as the first woman uh, appellate court judge, um, we had a few cases, a few cases. And I have to hear all these a few cases. Uh, and most of the cases that came uh, for us, I would say, because a few cases, normally we have three judges. Um, the chief justice would be uh, chairing the committee where I would be one of the committee and another civil court judge uh, and most of the time the civil court judge would advise on the procedures um, that were practiced in the civil court and I was wondering what would be my role so in uh, for example in matrimonial property cases uh, I would give my input uh, in relation to contribute, contribution played by the wife um, in the accumulation of the matrimonial property. You know, I would say that, you know, although a woman uh, uh, did not contribute to the accumulation of the matrimonial property, the fact that she had informally or give full support to the husband, although she's work, she's not working inside the home, she's working inside the home, not working with the husband. Her contribution is uh, should should not be looked into as something not important. The fact that she put the husband's mind at peace by looking after the children, by taking care of the household, that should be considered as well. And Alhamdulillah. Uh, in all these cases, uh, the chairman acknowledged uh, my contribution in saying that yes, women's or the wife's uh, or the former wife's participation in accumulation of the property is very important. So it's not just half, it's not just one, uh, one quarter, it used to be one quarter, it's not just half, it depends on her contribution. A percentage of contribution. Uh, if most of the time uh, she helped the husband, uh, he could be given three quarter if most of the time. So it's acknowledgement of women's contribution uh, in terms of property rights. So this is like uh, I would say uh, going into the area of women empowerment uh, through property rights, through property rights, and. Um, 
you know, it's not just uh, sitting and hearing these cases. Uh, I would get the friends, like-minded friends, uh, to write a book on this, uh, to write a book on women's rights. Uh, if uh, I found a friend uh, who, is, who has a very strong hold on uh, reading classical texts, I would request him, in most cases it's him or her, uh, to give me answers to some of these questions by referring to classical texts. Or I would look for expertise in whatever area in, in relation to the questions put upon me. So um, uh, I, I, I would just call them to give some answers and alhamdulillah, regardless of gender, they will assist me. Again, this is through network. So uh, my brother, I would say my brothers and my sisters have never, uh, if they are already at the upper echelon, uh, they will never look at those cases from gender perspective. Uh, it is about um, uh, implementing justice. Uh, but at the lower level, to go in is difficult. But once you are there, uh, once they acknowledge your professionalism, uh, it is it is not difficult anymore. They they, they have understood uh, that um, no, I, I would say no how is more important than no he. So it's more of no how. Uh, so that's the part. I built uh, to gain their trust uh, on uh, areas that I have developed. It doesn't come easy. Uh, it, uh, I have been there for, I would say, nearly 25 years now, Kosha. 35 years uh, working on this. I would say wholeheartedly because I think I have many witnesses in other areas, so I think. If I could work on this, if I can contribute on this, I will contribute in the best manner that I can. Uh, Professor Zalia, you have uh, spent, as you said, like over 35 years working for empowering women uh, in uh, Muslim countries and uh, especially in Malaysia. You have also been uh, 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 working in one of the OIC committees for women. And uh, so some of the key challenges uh, that you have found, if you tell us, what are the key challenges you have found uh, for uh, gender equality and gender equity? Because you distinguish between these two and you have written on that as well. So I want you to get, give us just a little bit of uh, uh, understanding. How do you see gender equality versus gender equity? And uh, what are the, the major uh, challenges you see in Muslim developing countries for females? Yeah, um, uh, when we talk about gender equality or gender equity um, or gender justice, there are many terms, eh? and these terms must be fully understood before we go forward. I am lucky in the sense that uh, after my teacher, Actually, my great mentor passed away. Um, there was um, one uh, student which he had supervised uh, working on gender equality. Um, later, she became my uh, supervisee. Uh, I replaced uh, Prof. Ahmad as the supervisor. And I asked her, to work on several areas, especially in distinguishing gender equality and gender equity. So, so she gave, I would say, three years commitment working on them. So I assisted her in terms of uh, looking into um, literature, contemporary literature in relation to it. Um, and then uh, working with other group supervisors as well, looking into, uh, uh, I would say, classical text, um, uh, doing a seal of the Quran in relation to uh, the relationship of 
men and women. Uh, and uh, I would say that the term gender equality as put forth by the feminists, uh, looking from the Islamic worldview, uh, does not sit well, does not sit well. So uh, we, I, I do discuss with uh, the committee at OIC because OIC, uh, all the countries in OIC are also uh, part of, I would say, some of it, or majority of them have signed uh, with the convention of the uh, elimination of the discrimination against women. And there are some, uh, I would say, articles in the convention which doesn't align with the Sharia. Right, so we have to find uh, ways on how to align. Find ways on how to align. Uh, the convention is a good convention, uh, but somehow it lacks the Sharia compliant part. So, Alhamdulillah, OIC has come up with what we call the OIC plan of action uh, for the advancement of women, which actually is a plan of action to ensure that the convention can be implemented in countries uh, who dear to the Sharia. Uh, just talking alone is not adequate, so we have to do research on this. Again, I'm lucky that I have uh, a student working on OPAO, we call it OPAO, the OIC Plan of Action on the Advancement of Women. I supplied him with the latest information on OPAO, and uh, we worked at it. I managed to get three more um, like-minded um, professors to work on this as well. Uh, so uh, I, I would say it is quite difficult for the student, but I'm glad at the end of the day he managed to complete the job. Uh, it's not easy to explain in this short and constraint of time the difference between gender equality and gender equity, but I would say that Although, uh, from the feminist point of view, gender equity is more of a process to achieve gender equality, but from the, uh, the Sharia point of view, uh, the term used is, is, I would say, gender equity because uh, uh, actions or plan of actions which should be uh, Sharia compliant are considered um, more equitable more equitable because we can't equate um, uh, women and men the same because we play complementary roles. Right? We play different roles complementing each other. That's why uh, I am uh, uh, inshallah, inshallah there's a new book coming up this year. Uh, one on um, uh, along the line of gender equity that is uh, approaches to uh, let me let me let me think again the uh, title uh, approaches to uh, empowering women uh, through property rights or through property rights uh, and the other book with uh, a few like-minded professors we are working on uh, uh, gender equity from Islamic worldview uh, theory and practice. So uh, I hope uh, once the book is out, uh, or those books are out, um, and, and things makes, make things much more easier. In fact, in Pakistan, I just did a book review on uh, Prof. Anis, uh, latest book on, um, I would say, uh, on gender, on gender. Uh, a very good book which has contributed uh, to the corpus of knowledge on gender relations. I would have to congratulate Prof. Ahmed for trying to do that. Uh, and he's looking from an uh, Islamic uh, worldview, which is actually quite difficult because he has to quote uh, many uh, cases in Pakistan uh, to show the differences between gender equality and gender equity. Yeah. Do we do so? Definitely, I would uh, try to look uh, look it up and. Uh...
you uh, have worked with OIC and as, uh, I mean, what are the initiatives OIC has taken to fulfill their um, OIC Action Plan 2030 for gender equality and for gender equity? Yeah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I came in as the first group, I would say the first group. Uh, it has been four years now working on uh, OPA, the OIC Plan of Action for Advancement of Women. So we started from scratch looking at the documents, identifying the loopholes of the documents, uh, trying to find ways to market the documents to Muslim countries and to find ways for the documents to be accepted and implemented in Muslim countries, or we say OIC uh, countries. Uh, uh, and then now, uh, not just uh, understanding the theories uh, of gender equality and gender equity, differentiating it with documents from uh, uh, United Nations. Uh, not only that, uh, we try to see uh, the most effective way how it can be implemented. So now we have come to a stage where uh, the committee um, are looking into uh, measuring performance of Muslim countries. If they have implemented uh, or how we have to measure the implementation to see uh, how far this country has gone into the implementation. So measuring is not an easy task and um, uh, we have proposed a, a few initiatives. I would say uh, short term, medium term and long term uh, to make sure uh, within the next five years we could see um, uh, the seeds, the seeds that had been planted I would say four or five years ago will, will bear fruits. So we hope to see that during our lifetime. Uh, uh, with this measurement, uh, uh, we have taken, I would say, Opal uh, one notch up, one notch up. Uh, and we have to rely on experts to come up with uh, how to measure uh, uh, this plan of action and then we have to measure not just the plan but also impact of the plan. Yes. Uh, so the uh, action plan 2030 is there and now just for a whole year we have been struck by COVID-19 pandemic and it yeah. has uh, halted uh, um, uh, life all around the world and uh, yeah. it has also uh, created a uh, uh, economic recession and uh, due to that the poverty levels are expected to go up and that will also impact all those initiatives that were taken for women advancement so how do you, how, how, how do you see the emerging trends uh, what do you expect uh, do you expect that 2030 action plan 2030 will it still be realized in terms of gender uh, advancement of women in Muslim countries? Um, last, if, if I'm not mistaken, last December, we had a conference. Uh, the, initially, before the conference, there was this uh, uh, OIC meeting with the ministers or uh, ministers of foreign affairs on issues which are very relevant to Muslim countries. And then we had on the second day uh, international conference on uh, COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19 on women and uh, relevant issues in relation to COVID-19. Uh, in that conference, I uh, remember we did discuss about uh, the challenges. Uh, for example, uh, we uh, in our discussion, we realized that it is a general, uh, uh, it's not, uh, it, it's not uh, something out of norm. Uh, that uh, uh, there were increase in the number of domestic violence. 
uh, during the uh, uh, MCO, uh, where I guess uh, members of the family are stressed. Most of them are stressed because they are asked to stay home. So this doesn't happen in Malaysia only or in two or three countries. Uh, when we had this discussion, we realized that it is happening in all countries. And we discussed as well ways on how to curb uh, the abuse of women during COVID. So these are uh, one of the, of the examples of the challenges that women face during COVID-19. Uh, when And then we realized as well, it's just not domestic violence. There are also cases of uh, uh, high, uh, high percentage of those who were late from work, right? Um, economic uh, uh, meltdown uh, and uh, other factors has caused uh, a lot of stress to the family members. So we were looking at the family as the basic unit of the society. So we have to ensure that the family is strengthened uh, during COVID-19. Uh, we have a lot of challenges without COVID. So COVID-19 has added up the pressures of the family, not just individual, uh, as a unit of the uh, family, as a unit of the family, the family and the unit of the society. So we were trying to find ways on how government, because OIC is a government-related institution. So we, are, so we had to discuss through that avenue to see how government could strengthen the family so that uh, these factors can be uh, looked into to find ways and means. Uh, effective ways and means to solve, or if we can't solve the problem, at, at least uh, uh, to cushion the fall uh, of the family in that sense. Um, uh, we had as well, I think uh, two years ago when I was doing my sabbatical, uh, Alhamdulillah was doing a project uh, with OIC on uh, how to strengthen the family. And uh, uh, Alhamdulillah as well, CELSWIC, uh, which is the uh, research arm of OIC, uh, is also working with us uh, in identifying, in helping us in giving data uh, of uh, data of all these uh, countries uh, in uh, OIC, 56 countries in OIC giving us all the data, otherwise we would be taking longer time in assessing and analyzing the data. So Stasri has been helping us and uh, Alhamdulillah, we managed to present it to the, to the meeting of the foreign ministers uh, last, also last December, I think last December after a one year uh, research. Uh, to tell them uh, exactly uh, where we should, where and what we should work on to strengthen uh, the Muslim family. Yeah, I have not mentioned you the challenges of the family as usual. Postmodernism, um, I would say, is uh, one of the challenges, one of the big challenges for the family, where, as you know, um, people are. Uh, People have become more materialistic, uh, less God-centered, uh, and this has caused problems for individuals. You know, once it's always I mean, you know, it's always individualistic. When human becomes uh, too individualistic, uh, I think uh, the society will not move far. So we are, what, what we are trying to do is not just identify the problem, but trying to use education, and now that's where education comes in, to use education to get people to think beyond themselves, to change 
the curriculum so that people will not just think about themselves but also to give service to others. In Islam, uh, the best person is those who have given service to the Ummah. So we try to create that, try to inculcate that uh, in our younger generation. Because uh, most of those, uh, uh, most of those, I yet to do research on this. Is, um, you know, in countries where the rate of suicide, committing suicide, is very high, uh, countries where uh, postmodernism has engulfed their people, you know, they are thinking about they are not being happy. They are it's inward looking because they are not happy. Inward looking. So that's the reason why uh, they increase the rate of uh, suicide. Uh, and the rate of suicide, alhamdulillah, in the Muslim countries are low. But that doesn't mean that we are happier. We are happier people. We have to do research on this. Uh, but I believe uh, using education to get them away from looking uh, inside by looking outside will change the whole perspective of things. So I guess that's um, my contribution with uh, like-minded plans on how to solve um, problems uh, from the uh, Islamic worldview, from Islamic worldview. Hey, uh, Professor Azalia, how do you suggest increasing cooperation and collaboration among OIC social scientists to fulfill the OIC goal of women in advancement? And what are the challenges faced by the Islamic countries in uh, advancing uh, women in Muslim countries? Yeah, um, as I've mentioned just now, the importance of networks, right? With uh, the OIC countries coming together Though it is formal, because these are government links, uh, we could empower the NGOs. Just like United Nations, um, every year they have their uh, uh, meeting of women, women NGOs. And uh, I've been to one of them, uh, CSW63. Uh, um, that was in 2017. It was a platform for all NGOs to network and link together, not just between NGOs, but between institutions. Uh, UN, that belongs to UN. So I see there's a lot that OIC can play uh, with um, uh, OIC Women's Council, for the advancement of women, we should rope in NGOs in all these 56 or 57 countries uh, in, um, in, I would say, first we start off with dialogue, having dialogue with them, trying to understand them, trying to understand the challenges that they face because these are the activists that works on the ground, that understand the problems on the ground. Uh, I've uh, done a lot of readings and I found in one African countries, um, they use women NGOs uh, to curb uh, drug abuse in the society. So women leaders, especially through mothers, uh, could play better role than government in identifying whether their children are involved in drugs or not and reporting to the relevant entities in relation to um, curbing drug abuse. So we could empower women to solve social problems because as mothers, I will say from the Islamic perspective, Mothers are the first madrasa for their children. So if we empower the women to be good 
mothers and educated mothers, the government would have lesser job. You know, like now their hands are full. It's, it's like left, right, center trying to solve social problems. Let the mothers, empower the mothers to do this at the family level. Right? So that the father would not have a lot of headaches, you know, when he goes to work. He would, he, he, he would not like uh, think about, let's say, uh, his children being involved in all this uh, social ills. So uh, I would say again, the challenges is putting trust on NGOs, trust, sharing the trust on solving uh, social ills with the NGOs uh, because these people are, do, are voluntary, are voluntary. You don't have to pay them. Just create a good social network for them and them being working out of their own comfort zone. They will do it. I believe. I have worked with them. Uh, the, I will say, the good ones, the good ones, and the passionate ones will be, uh, will be with the government. Will be with the government. Uh, trust them. They will do their job uh, well. Uh, Professor uh, Zalia, uh, we would love to hear your feedback on uh, what should be the role of Imagine Institute of Future Studies at Ikra University. Uh, what are your suggestions? We would love to hear your perspective on that. This is a very, I would say, a, a very difficult, but yes, difficult to do, but, uh, it, but it is doable. It's doable. Uh, first, I have to congratulate Imagine for taking for taking the initiative in identifying social scientists uh, so that we could network. To me, it's network. Uh, there are like-minded people all over uh, OIC uh, countries uh, that would want to uh, participate. In, um, in, in building a good society. Um, it is a good platform to get us all on board by identifying our expertise. Um, though uh, some, some of us are academics, but there are academics uh, and activists roll into one. Uh, trying to understand what is happening on the ground, that we could identify through imagine uh, um, how, most of, most of all, is how to solve the problem. Research based how. Uh, uh, this is happening in, uh, I think, in the United Nations as well. Uh, but I'm not quite sure whether there are entities that are doing this uh, at university level, at university level. Because most of the time, at university level, it's always academic. Imagine could play uh, a one-notch-up role. It could be two or three-notch-up role uh, by getting... Um, academics on board and imagine could identify issues, prioritize issues, uh, give it a uh, short-term, medium-term and long-term goal to achieve something uh, to see that if we want to solve problems, um, uh, we could motivate ourselves on low-hanging fruits, but uh, each of us would have our ways on doing things due to our various disciplines. And when we put people of inter and intra-discipline together, 
uh, Imagine can play the role of like telling us exactly which area you want to prioritize for that year or for the next two years or for the next five years. And we will just follow through. I, I know of um, a, a few uh, universities getting together to solve uh, social problems. For example, I think 10, you know, that was like 15 years ago when I was doing uh, my sabbatical. Uh, there was uh, one um, a professor, if I'm not mistaken, his name is Professor Brown from University of Calgary in Canada, trying to get 10 universities on board to discuss on issues, if I can't say, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's on um, understanding why women are excluded and, and trying to find ways on social inclusion of women. Okay. Understanding exclusion, promoting inclusion. So I thought that was a very good uh, research and could be used like, uh, if I were to represent Malaysia, I will use Malaysian data uh, to how to promote inclusion by understanding exclusion of women or basically mainstreaming women. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the research did not um, um, got off ground because of research grant. <laughs> so research grant is a very important component because if you want to go and get data, it means money. So I'm not quite sure whether uh, Imagine uh, could play that role, you know, um, trying, trying to uh, reach out under, let's say, 10 universities or 20 universities or universities in the 57 Muslim countries uh, trying to get support from perhaps IDB uh, to get research grants for this particular research. You know, whatever research that has been decided by Imagine. Because when you look at the bigger picture, you will see uh, which research should go first which research should be at the back burner. But uh, I would say uh, some academics are not good in looking for money or in looking for grants to support their research. So imagine you could play that role. So one um, playing the role, um, although we have SESRI under OIC, but uh, SESRI arm, uh, I would say arms are also short very short um, and I think they got they, they, they got grants as well but again their grants are limited but having another entity uh, to work on research I would say um, research not just research strategic research or research for policy making for uh, OIC Muslim countries uh, imagine, imagine could play that role then. Imagine could really do. There's no conflict of, uh, I would say, conflict of duties between uh, uh, Imagine and Sesame. In fact, they could work together. Instead of, you know, like this, it's like complementing each other. I think OIC needs a lot of entities like Imagine. Thank you so much for talking to us on Futures Talks today. Honorable Datushri, Dat Professor Dr. Saleha Bin Samaruddin, we salute you for your service to humanity, ma'am. And thanks once again for taking your time out. Thank you, Prashant. Thank you for having me. And, and thank you, everyone, for watching today. And we'll bring you uh, another leading scientist from one of the OIC member states in our next episode. Please stay well and do your uh, follow all the SOPs and avoid COVID-19. Thank you.